Hi everyone. This video session is going to discuss toxicology. Again, a topical review of what is a very complex and convoluted subject area. But hopefully everything that we've discussed in the last day and the stuff that we discussed on Monday and Tuesday will now start to sort of dovetail together into something that you can actually apply to your clinical practice. So toxicology then. Toxicology is the study of poisons and the study of when therapeutic drugs are given an overdose. We're going to talk about the toxic effects of medications on the human body. Now this is a little bit more of a lengthy presentation than the other ones that we've had today so if there are any discussions to be had or any questions then post them on the Padlet wall and you'll find the Padlet link in the description of this video or you'll find it on Blackboard Day 2 Pharmacology right at the bottom okay and I'll be active on that all this afternoon in order to answer your questions so if you need to ask anything post it to the Padlet and you'll get a response there pretty quickly. So we're going to dive into the presentation and we'll get through the content as best as we can. We'll take our time. We'll look at different presentations of different toxidromes. And hopefully this will inform your practice going forward. So let's get into it. So our subject today then is clinical toxicology. And this is a specific subspecialty of toxicology that deals with the management of poisoned patients. Including diagnosing the toxicological problem and onward care and management. And there's a lot of things to consider in this topic. So it, it is a lot of stuff to talk about. By the end of this presentation, then we're gonna hopefully have an understanding of what the term toxicology is, and we'll understand how to manage patients with toxidromic illness safely. Toxidromic meaning sort of uh, imbued by poisons or toxins. Now, this is actually a huge part of our jobs, whether we recognize it or not. We are frequently called to incidents that involve medications. These might be legal or they might be illegal. But as paramedics, we must be able to safely manage patients that have taken drugs in overdose. And this is something that you already do day in, day out as ambulance technicians. But there's a lot of other factors to this, not just the pharmacological factors, but the sociological factors around overdose as well. We need to think about those too. So a lot of stuff. So as a starting point then, we can think about toxidromic illness as being caused by two sort of subcategories of chemical. And this is, first of all, poisons. Poisons are a substance that are always toxic. It doesn't matter how much we get or how it is absorbed. These are going to harm us. This is poisons. On the opposite side of that, drugs are still chemicals that can still have an adverse effect but they are picked specifically from nature or they're synthesized because they have a therapeutic effect when they're given in the right circumstances or in the right dose. Now both these agents can lead to intoxication to toxidromic illness so we need to be aware that they're separate subcategories but the different chemicals can fall into both categories at different points all right so it's just an important distinction to make poisons versus drugs. Now, before we really get into the nitty gritty of this, there's a couple of different bits of terminology that I need you to be familiar with before we can really understand it. So first of all is bioavailability. Now we've discussed bioavailability already earlier on in the day, and this is the fraction of a drug that actually reaches the systemic circulation. And depending on how a drug is absorbed, we know that bioavailability can vary. So when we talk about toxic doses of certain drugs or when we talk about drugs being given in certain ways it's going to affect bioavailability so certainly if patients have overdosed on iv drugs or they've taken a drug via the iv route we know that the bioavailability is going to be very high compared to if a drug has been taken orally or topically via the skin this concept of half-life comes from chemistry although we're going to consider it in a strictly biochemical sense and this is the time that it takes for a drug to, for, to go from its maximum plasma concentration to half of its concentration. This is a great measure of how quickly your body is going to either metabolize or excrete a drug and it's particularly important when we talk about cumulative overdoses or overdoses that have happened over a long period of time. The last term we need you to understand is LD50 which refers to lethal dose 50 or the median lethal dose and this is the dose that would kill an average person when we're talking about a drug or a chemical. Now this can obviously vary 
between drugs, but the reason that we're looking at the median dose is because we need to think about the individual variations in patients. Some patients weigh more, some patients weigh less, some patients are taller. So all these factors affect absorption and affect mean bioavailability. So when we look at a drug and how toxic it is, we can kind of get a general gauge of how much they've taken and compare it to the median lethal dose, which will give us a good idea of whether we're going to see very, very, very critical illness in these patients. So it's actually a great value to keep in mind and I hope you can keep that in mind for later on in the presentation. Now, obviously, overdose comes in loads of different shapes and forms, like I said, with poisons or with drugs. But actually thinking about why the overdose occurred in the first place is probably where to start. Now, unintentional overdose occurs all the time, often involving children, but it can be in adults as well. Patients that have just been in a lot of pain, so they've taken a lot of their pain medication completely innocently, not hoping to hurt themselves. It's just something that they've done. Children are obviously at higher risk of this because they're smaller and they have this higher average bioavailability. And this can be just due to a more efficient cardiovascular system or the fact that they have less subcutaneous fat versus muscle or potentially depend on the age more subcutaneous fat compared to muscle and that alters inborn metabolism. So this all presents a lot of challenges to us, some of them sociological, some of them physical, but keep in mind the pharmacology when dealing with these patients because do you know what? Sometimes we can get caught up in dealing with the sociological side when actually we need to think about is this patient going to become critically ill in the next short period while I'm caring for them. Now, there are so many medications out there, both legal and illegal, that patients might take in excess. And it is completely and ridiculous completely and utterly ridiculous for you to keep track of all of them. We should try and keep some key presentations at the front of our minds and that's what I mean by talking about toxidromes. When we talk about toxidromes we're talking about constellations of symptoms that we can associate with certain toxic substances but do you know what it's always a good idea to look up a medication when you encounter one if you haven't seen it before. Use Google if you want to or you can use Talkspace to get an idea. Now Talkspace is this absolutely fantastic resource that you can get access to online. For NHS staff in Scotland, you can access it using your NHS Athens account or you can create an account online, but this is gonna be through an app on your phone. The desktop version of Talkspace is only available to institutions and we have access to it here at GCU. So if you want to request some information on a particular drug that's a bit more in depth than what's available in the app, then please just give me an email and I will furnish you with that. But obviously you can't use that in the acute care setting. So using the app is a particularly good idea to get access to information. So when we think about taking in chemicals then, we've already talked about routes of absorption when we talked about pharmacology. Obviously the rate of absorption will be dependent on how the substance is taken. Oral drugs provide more time for identification and treatment compared to injected drugs or drugs that are given topically. So it's just important to think about how the drug is given to think about how long you might have before the patient becomes unwell. And do you know what? It maybe gives you a bit more time to try and figure out what the problem is. When drugs are ingested, so when they're given enterally, i.e. via the GI tract, this can have immediate damage and delayed effects depending on how the drug is absorbed or if it's not very well absorbed in the gut. Now I'm thinking about, there are so many drugs we could think about when we talk about ingestion, but particularly I'm thinking about things like paracetamol, tricyclics, opiates, there are so many, but injury will occur with things like paracetamol, tricyclics, as long as the substance is present within the GI tract. Now this is where we start to talk about things like gastric lavage or activated charcoal, and I know certainly in the east of Scotland we have had a trial on activated charcoal for paracetamol overdose for a little while. It's very much up for debate whether activated charcoal is worth it in terms of intervention and it's if it's given within the right time frame then it can be worth it because obviously the active charcoal will take up an agent before it's properly absorbed but a lot of this has to do with time scale and it all makes general relative sense when you think about it. Another very common route of absorption when it comes to poisons is inhalation. Now agents that we're going to be particularly concerned about here is carbon monoxide, ammonia, chemicals like hydrogen fluoride and I've put a little diagram here that shows you some of the toxic chemicals that can be inhaled. Certainly things like chlorine, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, all these things we need to be quite worried about. 
Now, the one common feature of inhalational poisonings is that injury will continue occurring as long as the patient is in a toxic environment. So our first priority should be to remove them from that toxic environment. Now, that might not be something that you can do as a paramedic. We might need to leave that to the fire service or to special operations response team operatives who might be able to remove the patient from the toxic environment safely using the correct PPE. Now, this form of poisoning may be accidental or may be intentional, and I'm certainly thinking about things like CO poisoning. These can often be a feature of intentional overdose as well. So the safety issues, like we said, you're not going to enter a toxic environment until somebody who has the appropriate PPE can do so. I'd also bear in mind that patients who have taken in some sort of inhalational poison may off-gas during resuscitation attempts. So there may be pockets of gas that are trapped in their lungs and you may need to be very careful if you're undertaking a resuscitation attempt on these patients. Identifying the potential agent that's caused the poisoning might save the patient's life. So in, t in cases of industrial exposure or in cases of intentional overdose, it's really important to look for the chemical agent, whether there's markers, has chem indicators nearby, just to try and figure out what the poison is. And sometimes it'll be obvious, sometimes it won't be obvious. Then we come to injection. Now, lots of overdoses or poisoning may use parenteral use of administration, and I'm thinking about IM or IV injection, but we're not always talking about your, what I think typically occurs to everybody when you think about overdoses by injection, which are illicit drugs. This is not always the case. Now, things like spider and snake bites are also a type of injection injury. So, things like injection marts, stings or bites from insects or larger animals may be a part of an injectional uh, overdose as well. So not always the typical agents that you might think of. We're thinking of opiates and that sort of thing. Many injected venoms are neurotoxic and they can cause death quickly if left untreated. But obviously in the UK, we're probably not going to come across this uh, very often. In fact, you'll probably never come across this in your career. But it is worth thinking about. There are dangerous snakes kept in private residences and in in industrial settings or in zoos all over the country so the patient might be able to help you here was it an animal or was it a syringe worth thinking about now when we talk about toxidromes we're talking about a constellation of symptoms that is associated with a particular chemical agent now if you think about things like stimulants narcotics sympathomimetic drugs sedatives cholinergic versus anticholinergics all of these have particular signs and symptoms that are associated with them and they will potentially being familiar with these toxidromes might help you to identify the causative agent so if you think about your typical opiate overdose people who've taken opiate overdoses may or may not have but generally will have constricted pupils respiratory depressions they might have needle tracks they might be drowsy they might have stupor they might be in a coma they may be in cardiac arrest now all of these signs in any patient should start raising your index of suspicion towards opiate overdose. Now this is fairly common for all of us, I think we've seen plenty of opiate overdoses as ambulance technicians, so this one should come pretty naturally to you. But with other agents that we've maybe not heard of as much or we've not seen used as much, we need to become familiar with the separate toxidromes. So terminology, when we're talking about overdose, we're talking about drug abuse. This is use of drugs that harms the person that's using the drugs. But there is a difference between being physiologically dependent and being psychologically dependent. So when we're talking about drug terminology, being habitually addicted to drugs, hab habituation is that psychological dependence on a drug. Conversely then, physical dependence is being physically adapted to a drug's effects and with some drugs we obviously can't stop them very quickly or we can't stop them at all because drug patients have became so tolerant to their effects and a tolerance is this physiological adaptation to a drug's effect i.e it's pharmacodynamic interactions okay so we're now going to start talking about some specific toxidromes or some specific toxicology presentations and we'll start with probably one of the most common presentations to pre-hospital care which is acute ethanol intoxication 
Now, ethanol or drinking alcohol is an incredibly strong CNS depressant, and it has quite strong physiological effects when we take it in really large quantities. And the reason that we drink alcohol is to get a bit of CNS depression. Do you know, we get a bit of euphoria, we feel a bit tired, we feel a bit drowsy, but unfortunately it's additive with other CNS depressants. So if we're taking some benzodiazepines or some opiates at the same time, not necessarily uh, taking them illegally or taking them off the street, but potentially you might be taking a prescription form of these drugs as well. It becomes additive when you take alcohol with it. Now we're going to talk about acute ethanol intoxication, but withdrawal itself is a really challenging presentation and it's quite difficult to manage alcohol withdrawal. It is life-threatening in some cases and occasionally you might hear about alcohol being used as an antidote for life-threatening withdrawal, but in our in our circumstances, we're just going to manage the basic symptoms. And do you know what a lot of management of toxicological emergencies comes down to? Managing the basics. So alcohol is really rapidly absorbed through the gastric mucosa and pleak plasma concentration is reached within 30 minutes of ingestion, which is alcohol can start affecting you pretty quickly. 30 minutes seems like a fair number. Now absorption is delayed by food coating the GI tract. So if you've had a big meal and then you have a drink afterwards, that absorption process is going to be impaired. But once it's been absorbed, it is rapidly distributed to the tissues. 90% oxidized by the liver and the remainder gets excreted through your kidneys and your lungs as a gas, which is why we can smell alcohol on people's breath. Now, ethanol is not uh, metabolized by cytochrome P450. It is metabolized by cytoplasmic enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase and it gets changed from ethanol into acet uh, acetaldehyde. I'm terrible at pronouncing that. With some NADH as well and then it get gets oxidized into acetyl-CoA with some acetic acid and then it gets excreted. Now usual sources of ethanol are beer, wine, liquors, hard alcohol. Occasionally you might get an acute intoxication case from things like colognes or aftershaves, mouthwashes or particular food flavorings. But generally, we know where alcohol is coming from and it's coming from beer and wine and liquors. Now, obviously, we don't have the facility to test for alcohol concentration levels, although sometimes you can roughly estimate them. There are apps out there for doing this, which are quite handy. We can estimate them depending on the amount of drinks that a person has had. But do you know what? Asking that question in the acute circumstance is you're not always going to get a reliable answer from witnesses or from the patient themselves now sort of less than 50 milligrams per deciliter patients are often asymptomatic i'm not going to go through all of these but over 500 milligrams per deciliter can cause respiratory depression and death and the problem with acute ethanol intoxication is once somebody has drank alcohol and it's been absorbed there's no antidote, there's no obvious reversal agent like there is with opiates. So once we get to the sort of stupor coma level, it's all about support of care. Now, ethanol has a variety of systemic effects. It does depress your myocardial tissue at high doses and it causes this systemic vasodilation. We know that alcohol causes you to undergo diuresis, so your renal system will become more active due to inhibition of ADH secretion. You might get some gastritis. We can talk about hepatitis and acute pancreatitis as sort of symptoms of longer term alcohol abuse. Potentially, if patients become respiratory depressed, they might have a bit of aspiration. And in terms of metabolic effects, often patients who have acute ethanol intoxication are going to be hyperglycemic. The NADH production from ethanol metabolism impairs gluconeogenesis and that means that potentially lactate isn't converted to pyruvate and you may end up with a metabolic acidosis and occasionally with extreme cases you may end up with rhabdomyolysis this is from immobility now the key take homes for acutely intoxicated ethanol patients are to treat the abcs supportive care make sure that they have a clear airway ventilate them if required and transfer them to hospital if their gcs is less than 10 this puts them into a massive risk area so in terms of risk prognosticating these patients it's quite tough to do that but patients who have a gcs of less than 10 are in significant danger be aware of coexisting injuries or of diseases that might exacerbate their ethanol intoxication and try as best as you can to manage behavioral disturbance gently. And this is tough. People who are intoxicated are tough to deal with. 
nobody likes it I would encourage you to try and be as gentle as you possibly can and again this is not about being patronized and I know you guys do this already but do think about the physiological processes that the patient is undergoing because it is quite easy to write off a drunk as a drunk when actually we need to think about what's going on and why are they acting the way they're acting tough presentation tough patients to treat so on the other side then is stimulant stimulant poisoning now some examples of stimulants might be things like cocaine methamphetamine amphetamines uh, bath salts which are really common in the uk at the moment this is methcath and i get methcath ion now cocaine causes addiction really quickly it's a synthetic alkaloid local anesthetic used for sometimes but it's a cns stimulant and it is very quickly absorbed across membranes amphetamines methamphetamine and methcathinone are peripheral and central sympathomimetics now they have really complex uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics but they are agonists on these two receptors tar1 and gpcr which is really important regulator of brain monoamines and these are chemicals that are responsible for normal neurotransmission so that's why we have their stimulant effects so amphetamines and other sympathomimetics and we're putting the sympathomimetics in the stimulant category produce both peripheral and central effects complications from stimulant poisoning are hyperthermia we call that malignant hyperthermia hypertension cardiac dysrhythmia ischemia occasionally acute aortic dissection and intracranial hemorrhage now small doses in the intolerant so people that haven't had stimulants or amphetamines before can produce significant toxicity especially in children and again this is this whole low mean body weight and we'll talk about one pill kills later on in the presentation now we need to aggressively manage these patients and when i talk about aggressive management i mean good abcs rapid transport to hospital and if they require sedation then we need to sedate them now that isn't always an option for us although obviously with agitated delirium using some midazolam may or may not be in scope of practice depending on where you work or your local guidelines one option we do have is to use a pre-hospital care team or a critical care paramedic to sedate these patients and sometimes that is the better option in terms of their ongoing management. Now, MDMA and bath salts, uh, cathionone, can cause life-threatening hyponatremia, which results in seizures as well. We need to be ready to manage these seizures as and when they occur. Quite important to mention with stimulants is the potential for stimulant poisoning to cause acute coronary syndrome. And this is distinct from the MI that might occur due to atherosclerosis. This is due by uh, due to coronary vasospasm or acute dissection because of critically high blood pressure. So we can't thrombolize these patients because obviously they don't need thrombolized. They don't have plaque that is blocking their coronary arteries. So we need to resolve the vasospasm. So these patients require benzodiazepines and rapid transport. But unfortunately, GRCalc does not directly provide for benzodiazepine use in cocaine induced or stimulant induced acs anymore but have a look at your pgd for midazolam and we can discuss giving benzodiazepines for acs a little bit later now seizures in these patients are going to need treated just as usual with benzos four percent of patients with stimulant poisoning will have a tonic-clonic seizure during a pre-hospital care episode so need to be prepared for that one so that is stimulants now I want to bring your attention to what we call one pill kills and this is particularly about pediatrics and this is a great resource that has came from don't forget the bubbles now don't forget the bubbles is an online free open access medication resource and i really really suggest that you go and have a look at it because it has some great stuff particularly to do with pediatric care but when we're talking about toxicology this infographic that you can see on the screen is all about peds toxicology now these drugs are particularly lethal to children in small doses calcium channel blockers i think for an obvious reason they cause delayed onset bradycardia hypertension and they can block insulin secretion so again patients children particularly who've taken ccbs can become critically unwell very quickly same with tricyclics the block of sodium channels can lead to ibcd and can lead to cardiac arrest and seizures in these patients 
Now, the other ones, things like chloroquines, uh, you're not going to see that often. Things like fertilizer and that sort of thing, but we definitely need to be aware of them. Opiates in kids are particularly hazardous, again, because of the low mean body weight. And actually, if you have a look at GR calc, just an interesting point to bring up about GR calc. If you have a look at GR calc in children under 12, we recommend a much larger dose of naloxone compared to in adults, particularly because we need to completely block the effects of opiates at the opiate receptors and reverse it as quickly as possible. Whereas in adults, we might titrate to effect to keep patients groggy and easily managed. In kids, we're just going to give the full dose straight away to try and reverse that opiate blockade. Same with beta blockers, theophylline and amphetamines. These are all potentially drugs that might kill a child in a single pill or a single dose. So please be aware of these. Come back to these when you're talking about pediatric assessment and management. And I will link this infographic on Blackboard for you. Okay, so benzodiazepines then. So we carry benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines in their current form, we, we, the ones that we carry are diazepam and midazolam. And these are quite hazardous to the human body when taken an overdose. Now they're quite simple. They enhance the uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA by increasing the opening, opening frequency of chlorine, all right? And mainly they act on these GABA receptors. And we're talking about diazepam, lorazepam, midazolam, they are rapidly absorbed orally, so oral tablets have a pretty rapid absorption rate. They are protein bound, so they move easily within cell membranes and they are easily distributed about the, the body. Now, they do get metabolized in the liver. Duration of effect depends on how tolerant you are and the distribution rate rather than the rate of elimination, which is fairly fixed with benzodiazepines. Again, with these patients, we need to resuscitate them. If they're critically ill and they're not protecting their airway, then I would secure their airway, ideally with an eye gel or an ET tube. Isolated benzodiazepine overdose usually just causes a mild sedation and you can manage these patients with good ABCs, transport to hospital, and they'll be monitored and ventilated until they kind of come around. But adding other agents like ethanol will potentially increase the discharge rate it decrease the discharge rate or increase the mortality and it definitely is going to change your risk assessment so think about what these patients might have taken along with the benzodiazepines what about tricyclics then now we don't come across tricyclics that often certainly amitriptyline is something that's fairly commonly taken other ones like nortriptyline and imipramine are not seen that often out of hospital these are potentially cardiotoxic drugs and very very important to talk about in terms of overdose now, tricyclics are weak bases and they block noradrenaline and serotonin reuptake. So they are SSRIs, they block the uptake of noradrenaline and they block GABA receptors. The cardiotoxic effects of tricyclics come from blockade of fast sodium channels and that blockade is rate dependent. So actually at faster, higher heart rates, the tricyclics are going to block these sodium channels more and cause more cardiotoxicity. Now, this is how the cardiac dysrhythmias that you might expect with tricyclics come about. So, we can see some life-threatening dysrhythmias in patients who have tricyclic toxicity. The other thing with tricyclics is that they can cause inhibition of potassium channels in the sodium potassium pump and by virtue of that they can cause direct myocardial depression and you can link that a little bit to what Laura was talking about with the sodium potassium pump and heart failure so quite dangerous drugs to take in a therapeutic dosage now with amitriptyline doses of 10 milligrams per kilogram are potentially life-threatening anything over 30 milligrams per kilogram is going to result in severe toxicity with pH altering cardiotoxicity and a coma of more than 24 hours. Now, with doses of more than 50 milligrams per kilogram, you're expecting your patient to deteriorate pretty quickly after ingestion, one to two hours, even if the patient is well with a normal ECG. So don't be put off by the patient who has taken tricyclics in overdose but seems quite well. You need to monitor these patients and keep a really close eye on them because they are potentially sitting on a precipice waiting to fall off. Patients generally tend to pass out, have a bit of sedation and a coma, and then the cardiotoxic effects start to set in. You may see seizures, delirium, delirium, 
hypertension because of alpha blockade uh, and myocardial depression, broad complex dysrhythmias, or broad complex bradycardia, which is a preterminal sign, so I'd be very careful of that, and this agitation, restlessness, and the dry, warm, flushed skin because of peripheral, peripheral vasodilatation. Again, resuscitation focuses on a good ABCDE, rapid transport to hospital. We can give seizures, benzodiazepines, and if these patients are hypertensive, it's worth trying fluid replacement with crystalloid. But again, we'll talk about that more in part two. Okay, so the biggie, paracetamol overdose. Now, this is a complex topic that involves lots of different elements of pharmacology. We see paracetamol overdose. There's something like 150 care episodes of paracetamol overdose across the country every single day. So this is a very common presentation, and I'm sure you've all seen patients who presented with paracetamol overdose. Now, it's really easy to get lulled into a false sense of security with these patients. Often, they can become very unwell very quickly, or they will become acutely unwell over a very long period of time, depending on their dose. So we need to talk a little bit more about the pharmacology of paracetamol overdose. Now, survival from a paracetamol overdose is 100% if patients are treated with N-acetylcysteine within eight hours of exposure. So this is the antidote to paracetamol overdose, and it takes up this toxic metabolite of paracetamol, which is n acetyl p benzoquinonone emine but we can just call it NAPQA for short. So basically, the reason that uh, paracetamol is toxic is because of acute liver injury, and this is because of this toxic metabolite of paracetamol. So when we take paracetamol, cytochrome P450 processes the paracetamol and it turns it into NAPQA. In small amounts with therapeutic doses of paracetamol, we can excrete it and it's not a big deal at all. But actually with chronic paracetamol use, you'll see some buildup of NAPQA and this causes cell death and hepatocellular injury. And that's why, okay? So N-acetylcysteine is the antidote to NAPQA. And if we can give it within eight hours, then absolutely brilliant. If we can't give it within eight hours, then mortality is potentially going to increase. Unfortunately, this isn't a drug that we can carry. So this is something that has to be given in hospital. And this is why we take all paracetamol overdoses to hospital, or ideally we do anyway if they don't refuse. Now, like I say, small amounts of NAPQA are detoxified, uh, detoxified because they get conjugated in the liver and they get turned into two non-toxic metabolites. But in overdose, this increased formation of NAPQA depletes glutathione in the liver. And then once it's depleted, it covalently bonds to critical cellular proteins in order to kind of save itself. And this is why, apparently, or it's hypothesized, that the loss of activity of these proteins is what causes hepatic cell death. So basically, NAPQA is bad. We don't like NAPQA. It is what causes liver cell death. And in therapeutic doses, glutathione can detoxify it and get rid of it. In overdose, this glutathione mechanism is overwhelmed. Now, paracetamol, when we talk about its pharmacokinetics, it is well absorbed from the small intestine straight into the portal vein and into the liver. Peak concentration is one to two hours post-ingestion or 30 minutes if you take a liquid formulation. So it actually is pretty well absorbed. Resuscitation then is rarely required unless patients have taken huge doses which have caused coma and lactic acidosis but occasionally patients who have taken long chronic overdoses may present with coma and acidosis as well so normal attention to ABCDEs and correct hypoglycemia as you find it in order to restore those normal glucose levels so generally then we've talked quite about quite a few different drugs and quite a few different toxidromes but actually the only overdose that we can specifically reverse pre-hospital is that of opiates now i am not saying that the only overdose we can reverse pre-hospital is opiates so we don't need to care about the other toxidromes because part of our job is being a bit of a diagnostician and finding out what the cause of the injury or illness is and finding the correct toxidrome and identifying the agent of overdose is very important. We have a huge privilege in the pre-hospital arena of having access to the scene and to information that the hospital doesn't necessarily have. So capitalize on that and try and identify the causative agent 
before you get to hospital. ABCDE forms the mainstay of care for these patients, but knowing the toxicodynamics means we can provide focus treatment, i.e. sort of IV fluids or anything else that is required, benzodiazepines, naloxone if required, and we can know what might be coming next. Is the patient going to deteriorate, have a seizure, going to cardiac arrest? This is important information that we need to know at this level. So thank you very much for listening to me. That was a lot of chat and Unfortunately, there are other better resources out there. So I'm going to link some additional resources on GCU Learn for you to read or to listen to about toxicology. And in specific, a podcast by the Resus Room that is absolutely fantastic when it talks about toxic toxidromes. They do a much better job of this than me. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them on the Padlet wall uh, and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. So thanks very much for your attention, guys, and I will speak to you later on.